The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Just to clarify. I would like to move to accept tonight's agenda for September 14th, 2020, if I may have a second. Second. All in favor? Yes. Any opposed? So carried. Uh, we are going to open tonight uh, with our work session discussion with Policy Review Committee. And or take it away. Okay, we reviewed and accepted for a second read uh, the leave of absence, which covered the um, change of uh, uh, hours of leave of absence for voting from four hours to two hours, and uh, some new language in the patriotism, citizenship, and human rights education to ensure that we cover religious freedom. Etc. Um, and then the the others are all um, accepted as is. There were no uh, no edits from the existing reviews, which had done in the previous four years. We are deleting seventy one fifty, which is really about the involuntary transfer of students, and that involves special ed. So that'll be covered there because it's going to be replaced with two, three new policies, although I suppose they're revisions, but they're new, um, that focus on the circumstances of COVID-19. Defines extraordinary circumstances, uh, defines remote working, so that would be for the staff and uh, teachers, and um, remote learning, which would be for the students. So those policies are there. Uh, they came from BOCES and seem very comprehensive. Uh, the, the other second first reads are around student progress and we're actually gonna take a closer look at um, what uh, the circumstances are around acceleration and, um, well, everything, acceleration and lack thereof, shall we say. And that's uh, where the policy committee sits right now. Hey, thank you. Mr. Caseri, school opening update. Well, I'm, I, I, I want to bring Dr. Grupka and uh, Dr. Lyon into the conversation. Uh, you've obviously, you know, read my uh, material and know that um, school opened last week. Uh, I thought relatively well. Um, we had a few, as you saw in my email, a uh, few glitches with transportation. But we're able to work all of that out, I think, pretty quick. Uh, and so far, so good uh, with regard to those students that are with us on campus. Um, I think we've got that narrowed down. The drop off and pick up at buildings is you know, after a first day, which was confusing, particularly at the elementary level, seemed to, you know, go real well on the second two days. So I think that's just going to continue to grow. And, and, and they continue to kind of hone and develop at the administrators at each of the buildings. So seems to be going well. Uh, today was obviously a big day, the first full day of uh, the first week of, um, you know, the heart and soul of uh, the, the, the work. And so... Um, we did have the bit of a glitch with Google, although it didn't seem to impact as many as uh, I had originally thought. People were finding a way around it. It was working on some devices, wasn't working on other devices. There were um, some browsers that Google, like for instance, I, I was able to get to Google on Chrome, but I was able to get to Google and I was actually working straight through all of that on Microsoft Explorer. So it was very weird. Um, we, we did not hear of massive um, issues today, um, both at the elementary and secondary level. Um, I debriefed with all the, the building principals and, and got uh, 
you know, fairly good uh, debrief from them. Uh, Mr. Hill uh, and Dr. Lyon said that they thought went, that went well. I did speak with the teachers union and um, I also heard fairly good things there as well. So um, people seem to be working through it. Everybody seemed to be prepared for it. And there was um, minus some technology glitch, individual family technology glitches. There were all, all students were engaged in the virtual uh, learning model uh, today. So that's good. Uh, today was also the first day of the um, 100% remote model and uh, in terms of you know getting down into work, digging into the classes and understanding the schedule. Looks a little different at the elementary level than the secondary level. Dr. Lyon's gonna talk just a little bit about that. Um, but by and large, uh, that seems to be going relatively well. Um, it's still very new to people, I'm sure. So, you know, they're still trying to figure it out and working with their liaisons. And so we'll have to see how that starts to play out. But uh, overall, uh, I thought that went pretty good. Um, I'm gonna let Dr. Lyon just talk a little bit about um, uh, more of the detail of both uh, where we're kind of at with the hybrid and the 100% remote. Some things that we, are, that are going well, some things that we've uncovered, um, some areas that we're uh, looking to uh, continue to expand on uh, with both of those models. So if you just want to talk about the uh, teaching and learning piece, Dr. Lyon. Sure. So um, we find out something new related to this hybrid model just about every day, and that makes sense in light of the fact that we've never done this before. So for example, today I found out at the secondary level that in the text there are some resources that are not providing the text that we have to provide. For example, copies of books. Most books these days are available electronically, um, or some of these books we might already have within our, our own um, book closet so that we can provide the students with those. There are a handful of things that we may have to purchase but I have money available within textbooks and things like that to cover it. Um, the challenge is that we didn't know about it until today. Um, the, uh, we also have some questions from some families about do I really have to join in every day and what happens if I don't join in every day. So those are the types of um, troubleshooting things that we're working on right now. But the reality is that the teachers and the liaisons, I use teachers to talk about K-5 because they're providing instruction and liaisons 6 through 12 because um, they're really serves, serving as um, not the direct instruction provider, but the person who is checking in on social emotional wellness, doing circles with kids, um, the uh, secondary liaisons related to special education are providing uh, study skills, uh, daily, whatnot. Anyway, the, the, they are a PLC already. Like everything that, that they have done on campus leading up to having to work in this capacity is manifesting in very natural ways, um, spontaneously almost by them. So even though we don't ask them to like, hey, make sure that you connect with each other um, to see where you are, they're naturally inclined to do that because of the culture of our district. And that speaks volumes, right? It's not what do you do when you're told to do it, but what do you do when you have uh, choices um, because it hasn't yet been said. And they're just getting to that um, in front of even us saying it's been really beautiful. Um, at the elementary level, um, as I shared with you, we initially purchased education.com thinking it was a little bit like Apex Junior, if you will, in that um, the work that our teachers would have to do would be to assign assignments and look over those assignments, but not necessarily provide the instruction because we thought the instruction would be embedded within that. We realized that that's not necessarily the case. And so, um, Within a very short window of time, not even a day's turnaround, we had uh, we trouble uh, we were troubleshooting that and had solutions. Um, so now uh, K one and two, we had one teacher per grade level. They're meeting daily with students to provide instruction for an hour, and then the students are doing their work independently as independently as a kindergartner. 
first graders <laughs> and their kids. Um, and then at the uh, IEC, they have approached it in a departmentalized way. So that really all students are interacting with all three of those teachers, um, but each of those teachers is tackling um, a content area. We allege math, and then we have one person doing science and social studies because our students get basically half a year. We've talked about this at the four level before that um, science and social studies as an, at the elementary level is really like a half year course. Um, so anyway, if that's going very well. Uh, but so far, today is the first day doing the students. The, um, the open houses that we had for the virtual students went really well. They were well attended. People got their questions answered if they still had any. Um, and there was really positive feedback. Um, and then for our students who are on campus, <laughs> um, yeah. You know, again, last week we got great feedback about how pleased they were with how things went. And um, I really believe that uh, there are three components that went into that going as well as it did. I believe that that had to do with our planning that we did around uh, reopening. I think it had to do with our relationships and the communication that we had with people who were involved from the teachers and their 10 hours of planning um, to the family forums and so forth. And then I, I think that third component is perspective. Um, and so people are looking at other districts and feeling good in their not other districts. Um, and so for our uh, teachers, we have already started with professional development and professional development has been happening. Um, we, we are not pulling teachers for that. And so like um, Melanie Kitchen, who is our tech inter integrator from BOCES, she is offering um, after school opportunities that teachers are participating in. And so it's really six of one and half a dozen of the other, right? Um, are we going to pay a sub to be in the classroom? That, this is the normal train of thought. Do you pay a sub or do you pay the teacher to do that work? And typically speaking, um, we pay the sub because then that would be a captive audience. We can guarantee that the teachers will get that information. Um, now we're paying folks to do it after hours, um, and we can't guarantee a captive audience, but what I have seen time and time again in this district is um, that teachers rise to the occasion. So a uh, question came up, uh, Dr. Lyon, I just wanted you to address it. I, I addressed it a little bit. So there's some concern, uh, at least concern, or, or there's some discussion happening with some families in the 100% remote with regard to um, pacing and this notion that they're recognizing already that, you know, they can get quite a bit ahead and perhaps even take a second grade level this year. So what are your thoughts on there? I, I, I know that we have discussed this and one of the key roles of the liaisons is to try to facilitate the pacing. Well, what I have said to the liaisons because they are getting those questions directly is that, uh, that is, it is always our goal to differentiate from kids, right? And so regardless of where they're doing their learning, we want to make sure that we're meeting their needs. But at this point, even though Apex can do that, I'm not sure that we have enough information yet about what that looks like or sounds like in practice to be able to decide how fast a kid uh, right. can or should go. This is, I think, just parents taking an initial look at it and saying, oh, it's kind of maybe some families licking their chops a little bit saying, oh, this is a great chance for us to really right. get ahead. Right, but it's a little bit kind of like a buffet just because everything is out there right. and it all looks good. And they haven't got, and they haven't dug into the devil of the detail, which yeah. is there's more significant work then perhaps is, uh, and we, as I mentioned, particularly at the, at the middle school level, um, there are gonna be other uh, programmatic pieces coming online, like uh, some of the special areas, facts and uh, technology that aren't currently, that we're working on developing and adding those to those middle school programs, correct? Yes. The other thing with APEX is we have to remember that our students are going to come back to campus. And so we have to be able to meet their needs when they come back to campus. So if a student finishes 
essentially two math courses in a year, um, two English courses in a year or something like that, where does that leave them when they come back? Um, and so we need to think about short and long-term planning with both, both of these things. And we've never had to think about that with as many- Right, does a seventh grade, does a seventh grade uh, student come back who is so inclined and they're going to ninth grade English and ninth grade social studies, you know? Right. Um, so we do have students who are accelerated Correct. right now. So um, I was just working today. There are two fifth grade students who will be taking sixth grade math and APEC. So they, they're remote students who are um, doing the departmentalization with their team. And then, um, but for math, they're not joining for math uh, with their fifth graders. Fifth grade team, they are going to be in Apex for sixth grade math. Right. So we're already working. We're trying to we're trying to be accommodating. Yeah. But we don't want people to take advantage and and uh, not lose sight of the fact that it's not a race, and that this uh, that the courses. A, once I think people get into them, they're going to recognize that it's it's not as easy as it looks, number one. Number two, um, that you also have to recognize what's educationally appropriate for your child and what's socially appropriate for your child. And really, what's the end goal? You know, what's the end goal? Because are you looking, if you're looking to have your child graduate from school as a junior, that's and you're, that's a commitment you're interested to in make, which we do have one, two, three families every year make that choice. Um, it would be important to have that conversation with us, uh, but ultimately, um, the 100% remote model is a stopgap measure in the middle of a pandemic to support those families. It's not a be-all, end-all replacement of school. Correct, and that is why I the be all end all replacement, right? The be all end all replacement of school is homeschooling. Yeah. You know, that. Right. So if the child accelerates so much, when they come back to campus, what does that mean for them? Or if they decide not to come back to campus and we no right. longer have these opportunities, then what uh, position will the right. child and the family be in? I, I, I do want. Uh, you to kind of make sure that you're keeping a watchful eye on that because we, the consistent message needs to come from you. Uh, so oftentimes building principles maybe interpret that a little differently than others. And so, right, we need to have a consistent message on that. And I, I need you to have that, to be that consistent messenger on that. Because we want to hear people out, you know, and I want to understand what their end goal is for their child's education. Not that we, 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 we are one of, we, we, as a district, we already work significantly with families on, particularly in acceleration. You know, there's a lot of districts that they just will say to a family, no, that's not what we do, you know. You're not, child's not moving ahead. That's not how it works. Uh, we've never done that. We, well, actually, we did have a superintendent that did that. I was going to say. I have a question. Yeah. If if um, we ended up bringing all the students back to campus, right, and there was a child that had accelerated and moved forward, but that child was supposed to come back to campus, do they still have access to the online remote learning? Or we have said that yes for the for those students that it's working for, and and there are going to even if we. Unless the, there are going to be, I, I don't know how the state's going to play that out. Because if the school were to open, would it be a requirement? Right. We don't know. If we don't know if it's a requirement for, are people okay. still going to be allowed to have the option? Okay. If the state says to me, you can open up and bring everybody back. What if the state mandates you open up? So it's time. They, well, then, then. Do all students come back? They would have to, yeah, if that's what the state, if, if, if there's no longer that option. <laughs> Currently, right now, under executive order, there's that option for families. The Apex program would then shut down? Correct. We could use that for credit recovery, which is what we initially bought it for. But that, Charlotte, your point is well made in that that is part of the reason why pacing 
our liaisons are casing this together Correct. in there because we are a belief that at some point they're going to come back to Canvas. Right. And we want it to be able to integrate the students back to Canvas as smoothly as possible. And so that is why the assigned, we are working with the teachers on Canvas to understand what's being taught on campus and align what's being taught in Apex to parallel that to every extent possible. So, so one way or the other, if everybody needs to end up going on remote and they want to join that's correct. At any an, an actual point, teacher, instead of using Apex, they can easily slide right back into the classroom. Mm. That said, it is not always as seamless or a beautiful one-to-one -one match as possible. So for example, um, our sophomores uh, are required to take CFM, right? That finance, uh, what's the- Career and financial management. Yes, yeah, thank you. And so there is obviously not a course in APEX with that exact title, but there is a course in APEX that has most of the information that our students on campus in CFM learn. So that's the course that we enroll them in. Because it's like a money and business course, yeah. Right, because we want them to be able to learn that same information in their sophomore year, like the sophomores on campus, and not require them their junior year to have to take it because that upsets the apple part here too, because then we have too many students who might need that. Do you see what I'm saying? Um, Another thing that we might want to focus on too is getting the message out to parents that even though kids could, work ahead, it's not necessarily healthy to. Like, for instance, there's a lot of wasted time in school. I mean, it just is. If there's passing time, there's there's time when the teacher is collecting papers and settling down. Where at home, a, a student can maybe get a 40-minute class done in 20 minutes because they're working at their own pace and there's no waste of time. That's right. But if they were to, to, to bulk up on so many more classes or whatever, or if they're working six and a half hours a day on work, it might be too much. And they're going to end up burning themselves out. You know so what I mean? one of the things that our uh, remote liaisons did last week before the actual implementation of the courses that started today was to say to the students, you know, here's your schedule in terms of here are the courses that you're taking. Create a daily schedule for yourself and share that with me so that I can give you feedback about are you utilizing your time at home and, and uh, not just effective, but also efficient manner. Um, because it probably doesn't take the same amount of time to get done at home what it takes to get done at school. I have, a, I have a Yeah, question. any questions on teaching and learning for, for Dr. Liner? I have a question. So if the elementary teachers are providing the instruction, what is IXL providing us now? To the that, remote learners, uh, that is providing additional supports. So there are videos that will go with it. There are assignments that can go with it. Um, so it is um, it's meant to be supportive of what they're doing. It's a resource. And Anything else for Heather? That resource specifically, not, um, ISL is the parent company. Education.com is a subsidiary of IXL. Our remote learners will have access to IXL and Education.com. Our on-campus learners will have access still to Education.com that uh, the teachers might want to use with the students on remote days or there are assignments in there and whatnot. So it's a it's a nice additional resource that we have for uh, teachers and students. So there because our on-campus uh, learners are getting direct instruction. The issue with education.com was that it wasn't providing the instruction that we had hoped for, but because our on-campus teachers are, education.com becomes a nice uh, resource. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say, just to Danielle's point, so the, those teacher liaisons are implementing the IXL curriculum. They're not teacher liaisons, they're actually oh, I'm sorry, teacher, teacher I'm, yeah, I, I didn't teacher. have, I had my, my verbiage wrong. No, it's not really curriculum. It's it's assignments, it can be quizzes, it can be okay. Their curriculum actually is parallel to what the okay. students are getting on campus. Um, and that's the nice part about who is teaching these things. Like Katie Reese, for example, is a kindergarten teacher on campus, but she has all the remote kindergartners. 
So she's a part of the kindergarten team, has been, knows what they're learning, and so she can provide that instruction to our remote kindergartners that is as parallel as anything we could. So we had said that our fully remote kids were going to be asynchronous, but now are they synchronous too? It's only synchronous for now, but we always said that they were going to be with us for a period of time okay. for check-ins and things like that. So in addition to the check-ins, we're doing the instruction. So there is a set time that they need to log in? Yes. yes. But that was always going to be... Are we having any issues? I know we were worried about like people who might have their kids at daycare or whatever might not have the opportunity. There are a couple of people who have expressed concerns about that um, because they didn't understand that that would be a part of it. But for the most part, um, the remote, the elementary remote learners have, are with somebody who is helping them. And we did send out a survey um, early on to ask them uh, to ask the family who is going to be with your child doing the remote learning. What is their capacity with technology? you know, questions like that so we could get a, a nice understanding and work with them. Okay. Any other questions? So um, this has not been without increased costs, unfortunately. Um, and uh, there have been some increased personnel costs. And I wanted to kind of give you an idea of where we're at right now in terms of um, costs that we're not necessarily budgeted for. So Patty's going to hand out uh, some materials and then look at some offsetting costs as well uh, to make up that difference. So if you look at the first one, Well, let's get let's let them get out first. Okay. Bam. So, so what you're looking at, if you look at the first column where it's peak, like these are some of the additional costs, and these are not any of the costs that go into last year. So if you remember last year, we were closed for a few months, but we still ended up buying some PPE. We had to buy additional cleaning supplies. We delivered lunches. We um, did large bulk mailings to families to homes. None of these costs are included in here. This is really this year's costs. One of the things that um, occurred is <laughs> um, our unemployment went from about $45,000 a year to over $200,000 a year. So our substitute teachers this year were allowed to collect unemployment. Well, the district was not on the hook for the $600 extra that people got. We are on the hook for any benefits that people get. Um, that is a significant change in what we're used to seeing. Um, we did have to hire remote teachers to replace, uh, we hired teachers, some of them to replace the remote teachers and some to be remote teachers. Um, so if we had to pay them out for the full year with benefits, um, we're looking at about nine and a half teachers uh, for a total of $573,000 roughly. Um, I factored in uh, family or single plans for all of these um, new teachers. Could be a little bit more, could be a little bit less, depending on what the teacher's needs are. Um, and this is assuming that we're working all year. Um, we are providing our nurses with some additional time in each building. So they felt that they really needed it, needed to be there a little bit earlier to check the kiddos in. But they still have kids that they see at the end of the day for a variety of things. So um, that just seemed very reasonable during this time. We spent about 109, well, we spent exactly 195,000 on PPE and additional cleaning supplies this year. Um, that includes all the sanitizers that we're using at the buildings and our spray guns. It includes the spray guns, um, some new mop heads. It includes uh, masks, all different kinds and sizes of masks. It includes um, face shields, desk shields for our elementary kids and some of our reading teachers. It includes uh, hand sanitizer, just lots and lots of stuff. Um, 
It also includes some filters, because remember we talked about getting upgraded filters, and we know that in addition we'll be needing three changes, so we ordered them now because the lead time on those has been incredible. Um, I didn't put the charge in here for this, but we needed additional laptops for child nutrition so that they could run remote locations, and I, I just didn't get that in in time today. Apexandeducation.com was $31,995. Um, we purchased some webcams for $4,000 for teachers to try out so that they can teach remotely. Um, 20 hotspots were $18,000. Um, those are one year licenses with support for OCs. We brought on four additional tech liaisons, one at each building. Um, those are $3,800. We're paying teachers to be tutors, and the tutors are going to be content specific. So if I'm a remote learner and I have a liaison, um, my liaison at the secondary level might be a Spanish teacher, but if the support I need is in chemistry, I would not expect her to be able to help deliver chemistry um, instruction or chemistry support. So we're trying to get tutors in every content area so that if the child is struggling at the secondary level, they have a tutor that will be able to provide instruction in that content. So kind of like the like what we would do in the three to five program. Here's that's exactly what we're doing. So is that money that we would have spent in the three to five program sure. or well maybe or maybe not um i don't i don't know if I okay see what we would have spent yeah that. but it, it is yeah. definitely there's definitely some money there that would have been spent in three to five um we increased our zoom no, licenses we we added a different kind of license so that that was a bit of an increase so our total spending at this point is one point is a little over one million almost 1.1 million um, the very bad news is, in the midst of all of this, our state aid is being withheld at 20%. And what is astounding to me is they're talking about withholding all of the aid, and that includes um, building aid, which is money that's already been spent in Barbara. Um, right now, our first withholding was $108,000, and that was a high cost aid. Um, we know that they're going to withhold 20% of UPK, which is $26,000. And just in our September 8th payment alone, we're looking at $499,000 withholding. The problem with withholding is they're saying they're withholding it in, until the federal government comes up with more funds. Uh, if that doesn't happen, it will become more of a withholding. Well, it's permanent, yeah. Um, so this is what we're looking at. If you see the box here and that red amount, that is what we will be at a deficit of that was not budgeted as of the end of September. So we're looking at a $1.7 million um, redu reduction both in additional spending and in, in a cut in revenue. If you look at the next line, if they continue to cut aid, so our state aid is um, $17.4, almost $17.5 million, 20% of that is, is $3.5 million. So we could be looking at another $2.8 million in lost revenue if they continue to withhold the 20% or if they continue to if they eventually cut it. That number is deeply concerning. I want to go over next door to the blue column um, and we're going to talk about some offsetting costs. So when they came out with the CARES Act money, if you remember in our budget, there's a line that's negative, which is the pandemic adjustment. It was $234,000. And then they gave us CARES Act money in the same exact amount. So basically they took away what they were gonna give us. So we, it was net zero. Um, it ended up not being net zero because some of that money we do have to share with our non-public kiddos. Um, but we didn't budget all of it back in when we were or budgeting because we really didn't know what they were doing at that point. So we will essentially have an extra $200,000 in those funds. So if you look at the, S, the ESSER and GEAR, um, we will be getting those funds from the state. That's the, that's the CARES Act money. We are not going to be spending all of our full curricular activity money this year. We will not be running late buses and we won't be having all of our clubs this year. Um, fitness chaperones, the fitness room, we can't open anyway, um, or we couldn't open early on anyway, so we will not be providing chaperones for that area. Um, not running modified sports this year, that saves us a little bit of money. Um, intramurals, we also will not be running this year. 
Um, we had some money in our athletic contractual codes. Um, so what we're looking at there is officials and then um, just some additional costs when our teams go to states and competitions. I think there's gonna be some savings there. Um, in our transportation codes, you would think with less students on campus, we have less buses. And while we do have less buses at the elementary, we had to schedule more buses for in other areas in BOCI. So that's gonna be a break even. But we are gonna be able to uh, recoup some money in the sports trips and field trips. Um, if you remember at the end of the, at the end of the budget season, we talked before about before Patty talks about that, I just this is just an initial there are many other codes that we will be looking at as we have to and really looking at them carefully in terms of what we're spending, what's not being spent, and those kinds of things. These are just some initial things that Patty and I kind of brainstormed where we're not spending money. So if you remember last year, um, we, end, we ended the year with a couple of months of money that we didn't spend on transportation. And we took that money and we said, we're gonna hold on to it because we had some, um, we had some legal concerns because some of our transportation companies were suggesting that the governor said that we were paying all of our vendors and employees. And when we looked, went back and looked at contracts, we really only paid for services provided. But while those things were pending, we took that money and we held it in encumbrance. Um, so that money still sits there. And what we know now is that really no, they understand that, that, that that money, that they won't be paid that money. So we have held on to that. Um, so I, I'm comfortable putting 1.3 in at this point. I don't think we'll get the full aid that we budgeted, but I think we'll be close. Um, so if you include that, that brings us to about 1.7. So up to the end of September, I think we're okay. The problem is <laughs> that we've got to get past September. So we'll, we'll see. Um, if you look under that as well, um, they are talking about reimbursing um, employers, non-for-profits, up to 50% of the unemployment that we paid out. Um, and they have this nifty new form out that we're gonna have to take a look at and dig into this week um, to see if we can recoup some of that. And then, you know, I did do my theme application. It was lengthy and arduous. And then at one point they said they're not gonna fund school reopenings. And then it got a lot of bad publicity. And then they said, well, they're gonna fund some of it, but not up to the, only up to the day when school opens and anything after school opens, they want full fund. And I'm not sure what that means. Um, but we did end up putting all of, uh, all of the expenses in. So, um, if we 75% of that will get us 144,000. So, we'll and and hopefully um, that 633 will not be a withholding. It will not be a cut, but simply will be distributed further down the road, um, which would obviously be helpful as well. I feel like um, you know I, I just I want you to know where it is and where it's going at this point. Um, Let's point out though that that's a shell game for the state because if they're going to take this federal money. And only just replace aid that we already had coming. We're not getting anything extra from the federal government. Correct. That is true. Correct. We're just hoping to maybe get our actual yes. aid that we're due. Correct. That is exactly what we're hoping for. Um, yes. But we were smart and we cut it out anyway. So yes. it actually would be a bonus for us. But you're absolutely correct, Betty. Uh, in terms of the way that the the aid package was laid out, um, it, it was not uh, kind of like lottery money. Correct. Yes. So by shell getting in being held hostage. Yeah. Well, it's not even just being held hostage, but he's holding our aid that we already had coming hostage yes. based on federal funds coming yes. through. So whenever federal funds come through, don't anybody think that schools are getting a bonus because all we're getting is the money that we're supposed to be getting. Well, and, and uh, you know, right. as much as the governor has done a good job keeping our, he has traditionally been. Um, well, he balances his budget on the back of education. Correct, always. and he's tr and he's traditionally held on to monies that were uh, owed to districts, mm -hmm. um, GEA being one of them, overpayments being one of them. Um, that it's unfortunate, but that's the way the state has played the game. I know? do have a question. Can you explain the unemployment? Because we I don't think we laid anybody off. So we, we didn't. didn't, <laughs> we didn't lay anybody off, and. Um, but what, when, when this started, what they said is it, it's, you know, anybody can apply, including substitutes, 
including people who had second jobs in the summer, who now couldn't work their second jobs, you were eligible. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of people who applied. But why would that be on us? Wouldn't it be on the second job or on the... The, the substitute teachers, it would be on us. Yeah. Well, but it shouldn't be fully on us because they don't substitute. Even really, if, even it's if based on their past, their past but work. But even if you're a second employer, you, did, you do get a share of it. It's just how unemployment works. And then the other thing is that, like, we, because at Yorko, we had layoff. We're not getting hit for any of it against our rating because it's COVID-related. But you're not on for profit. So uh, we're not getting the 600. I mean, right. it, it's, it, none of it is that. It really is just that, that much money in, in substitutes and people who no longer work here, but maybe work here for part of the year. So if you retire and work somewhere else and got laid off, we own some of that unemployment because it goes back for the year. So there's a couple different situations. You know, we've, we fought as many as we could. Uh, we are getting a little bit back, but at the end of the day, we're still looking at a $200,000 Crazy. It's crazy. Any questions on the funding and uh, the expenses to this point? You mentioned the FEMA money. I know that you have been really diligent in applying for all of that, and I saw the same notification that you did saying that they were now considering those to be uh, increased operating costs and not um, I hadn't seen the, the update so it looks like they may be sending some of their money they haven't, they haven't technically sent out an update but I, I work with um, Tim Kelly and I here with Tim Kelly she's our rep and he basically said after all the bad publicity they got now they're saying well maybe you know this is new for them too, by the way. I understand. So, you know, this is new for us. This is actually, if you think about the origins of FEMA, this is their first biologic disaster. Like they don't have anything else like this. So um, they're trying to feel their way through it too, and I'm sure it's been more costly than they anticipated. Um, so now they're thinking that they will fund schools up to the point where school is in session. Originally they said sanit sanitization only. So you know, the, the cleaning supplies, anything that uh, PPE related, but not, you know, not the things that you use to open school. So for example, maybe not the, the desk shields or not the social distancing tape and those kind of things. So we, they, we haven't received any money from FEMA going back to. No. So that's still all on the table. All on the table. Right, just wanted to confirm. The cost of instruction, the mailing out of things, yeah. the delivery of lunches, um, they will not Cost well, I don't know how to cover it related to cost of lunches, but the cost of delivering lunches and the paper bags and all that stuff, they will not cover. Okay. They won't cover anything that's a state mandate. Mm. Nobody's playing nice with that one. <laughs> <laughs> so. Anything else on uh, school reopening or any other questions on? I do want to say, I just want to give a shout out to our custodial staff and quite frankly to all of our staff who are helping support them. Um, they said that they are just, they're so, they're so pleased with how everyone's willing to work together and help and really make it happen for the kids and, and for each other. They really work together as a team, so go team. So I guess my question is, we barely have enough money to squeak by through the end of September. What are we going to do if we don't get any of this money back? When are we going to start making those decisions and being proactive about saving yeah, our budget? We've probably got about another uh, month and a half to see where where this all plays out. Um, unfortunately, Betty. I know everybody's essential for what we got going on. Correct. We may we may have to try to hold on until after uh, November uh, and see what the um, you know see what the election holds. That that could that I believe the election will have a factor in terms of how this all plays out currently right now. So from a, a so the, the other answer that you know like you I know what you're thinking is where where's the money we still have this this does not touch any fund balance so I, I guess I should have made that more clear this encumbrance from the prior year is not part of the fund balance. 
So we still have one. We still have about another two million that we could dip into. Right. Moving so, forward. And so there's and we have so that's remember we've got about a little we've got over four million. Go ahead, I'm sorry. We're not gonna start talking. We're not gonna already start talking about reserves. No, no, but yeah, no, well well there but but no, we have there's the two million we've committed to this budget, and then there's the unencumbered, which is a, close to another two million that we have sitting there, a little less. Um, we we are also allowed to use repair reserve for this, so what, you know we will have some money in repair reserve that we can use. Um, in addition, if we needed to liquidate other reserves, while well, I would hate to do it, if we needed to do it as an emergency, we could. Um, the other thing you can do at the beginning of the year, which I, I don't like the idea of this because then there is the payback end of it, you could go into a revenue anticipation note. We also have we have we have almost nine hundred thousand in a tax certiorari account that, you know, we we yeah. don't know where that's going to right. where that's going to play out with the my my hope beyond hope is that the a judge will whatever the chain whatever the assessment is that they'll just say that's what it is moving forward. Right. Mm -hmm. We just have to keep in mind that. Well, we hope that these are all one-time expenses. We have no idea. This could go on for a couple of years. Betty, it will right. bank. It will bankrupt us. I, I mean, we will be down to. Right. It will be significant. It and would bankrupt us. And the state doesn't have any money. Right. The state is. Well, I mean, the. Deep in the red. I, I mean. I know. What you're watching play out. What you're watching play out in a district has a lot to do we we saw very quickly for us to do the remote model we we couldn't do it with the people that we had to bring on some more people yeah i mean there, like, there was just no two ways around it and we got too deep into it and it was just like we got to do this and you know we thought in our minds where you know where the money's coming from how we're going to pay for it and we just had to do it and unfortunately, if we had dilly dallied and not been decisive, we could be in a similar situation. Oh, no, no, we had to do this. Yeah. yeah. And Paul will tell you this is one of the many times that I, he and I did not argue about money. Okay. Uh, that's not true, but it was. <laughs> we argued less because it was, it was like our backs were against the wall, you know? <laughs> And I mean, when you look at the money that we get from state aid, the money that we're losing, we only get you know so much of our money from state aid. There are other districts that that is the majority of how they fund their district. And when you start talking about these kind of cuts, I mean, it's going to bankrupt everybody. Oh yeah, yeah. And not new thing. <laughs> <laughs> They've got so much fun balance; they don't know what to do with it. But I mean, this is. This, this is not a problem that is unique to us at the moment. So unfortunately, not. It, it is. Uh, it's a desperate. It's a desperate situation, and unfortunately, we are a bit caught in. There's a. There's. There is. It, there are politics being played here. There definitely are. You know, and it's a tough time right now because the stakes are very high on both sides for both sides. So. You know why the fact? Why did? Why could they not? They came. They came to a huge deal back in what March, April. Oh, because the stock market changed. The feds. The stock market looks good now, so there's no emergency. Right, right. But you would think that they would come to a deal. Who knows? Who knows? Well, I don't understand it. I I do understand that you know we do need to think of the things that you know may have to go going forward so but well get through September? I mean, in order for us to maintain this we have to maintain the instruction yeah you know all of the i mean we're talking sports we're, we're saying right now we're going to run five brad is brad is having his coaches meeting on wednesday we're having we're running going to run five sports no modified no but that would all go folks that yes, would that's what we're thinking right there. that would all have like this co curricular, we had said that we were going to delay them five weeks, but that's the number for the whole year, right? No, that's, no, that's, that's not that's the number for the whole no, year. No, no. no. That's, that's a huge number. It's a $200,000 number more. So that's just what we're going to say by delaying? 
Uh, no, that's cu just cutting. A f we, we, we looked at some of the ones that we wouldn't be gotcha. running. Remember, we're not running late buses this year either. Um, so. But that number's about 200,000. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there, are, there are plenty of places that we could go to, but um, if I have to maintain the instructional program and the hybrid model and the remote model, that is the most important thing. Yeah. yeah. That's the most important thing. And we will. Yeah, we will. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, you know, we're running sports. We're going to try to open up with these, these sports and, and uh, you know, we're not going to be running transportation. We're not required to run transportation to sports. Um, but, you know, you folks may hear some of that a little bit. You know, people are going to have to recognize that our school sports are going to become travel programs. It is, it is absolutely amazing to me that we're running any sports. And anyone that would complain well, would be... Do you anticipate that there will be students because they have to provide their own transportation that will not participate? I would anticipate that, yeah. So you may have teams that you may not even be able, be able to field, have. yeah. Might not have enough students. Correct. Plus, we have students that aren't good. Yeah. I know. We have know. students that aren't going to play because they're concerned right. for their health. I mean, right. it's going to be interesting to see what we can field and what we what we can't. Mm -hmm. Which gets us to the COVID nineteen. I wanted just to update folks on that. Uh, you've seen a lot of emails. So on the front page of the website, you'll notice the flowchart has been. Uh, this is the most recent update to it. Um, so there are five scenarios on our flow chart. And of those five scenarios, uh, we currently have um, three teachers and uh, three students who are in scenario one. So they are in a quarantine for suspected to have had close contact with someone who tested positive. So they are currently in quarantine. Uh, most of the, for most of them, their quarantine is at day seven or eight right now, because uh, they are all came about um, on that uh, Thursday prior to uh, going out from school. So, no, I'm sorry, no, it came on that Sunday of Labor Day weekend. So um, we have students there. We do have, um, three students who are in students and staff tested positive or suspected of having COVID um, with symptoms. So they're in column two and uh, working with our nurses and uh, Niagara County Health Department, but they need, they will are required to have a proof of a negative COVID test to return back along with all of the other symptom resolutions. And then there are two other scenarios. Um, one is, uh, They've tested positive but had no symptoms. They still they still require the uh, COVID test. We have two students, I believe, right now uh, that the nurses are working with that are in scenario four. So students or staff or visitor exhibit one or more symptoms of COVID-19 but is not suspected of having COVID-19. Uh, working, they are still required to show proof of a negative COVID test by Niagara County rules. So we're working with those folks right now. Uh, of those, most of the families have been very um, good with our nurses and understand the requirement and are willing to very much do that. I believe uh, the nurses have only had maybe one issue with a family saying that that's just not necessary, but that's the rules that we're playing under right now. And we do have one teacher who uh, unfortunately due to a family situation had to travel to a, a, uh, a state that is under um, the, uh, what's it Patty? The Travel not the travel advisory. So that, that teacher is in quarantine uh, upon the return, and we're waiting for that quarantine to end. So I have a question about those. So considering the fact that we can't really afford to have anybody being paid that isn't doing meaningful full-time work, are we allowed to have these quarantine people who aren't sick perhaps performing? We do. Like we have one currently right now, yeah. Uh, I could do this from my town. Oh, right. I'm really tired. Right. Well, you know, he's like, that's bad. Um, so he is. So we, you know, we still have to have us up in the room because there's kids. Obviously, right. Um, but he's actually. Like, or if he can't teach their class, could they at
um, this particular teacher is in a very difficult um, time. Set. Okay, I'm just saying in the future, not necessarily yes. the teachers who are. Absolutely. We are going to so, work with them. And the other thing I, I would like to mention is, you know, we talked about people who are referring to your test as positive. So far, no one who has tested positive has actually been on campus. Right. Important. That's important to recognize. I had that conversation with my son right before I left to come here. Did you know that, you know, that, and, you know, obviously that's been out in Paul's email and if you look at our dashboard, we have nobody exactly. on our dashboard because our dashboard looks zero, all, all zeros because but we have not had anybody on campus. But that's important to reassure people at this point. Because I, I'm saying like he asked because it was get you know, students were, I guess, discussing that. So. Yeah. Uh, I just want to update you on that. You saw the draft letter that will go out if we do have a case that is uh, that erupts on campus. Um, it won't necessarily shut the school district down, um, but we'll be working with those students and families that may have been in close contact working with the Niagara County Health Department. Okay. And it, it may happen. It is in our community. So. Oh, for just sure. know that we are prepared. We almost, it almost happened. <laughs> and I think that uh, kind of summarizes um, kind of where we're at right now as of five days into this. Anyone have any questions? Questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, board and district goals in the short amount of time that you had to look these over this afternoon. <laughs> um, did everyone have a chance to review? Is well, there, and you have some more time. Too. You do, because we're going to, um, we're just going to look at them in the draft tonight, and then we'll look at um, actually adopting them at the next meeting. So it'll be a couple of weeks. So I know um, Paul said earlier that he wanted to get the district goals out to the administrators, have them take a look and have some feedback and then have an opportunity for everyone to actually read them over. And this just all came straight from the retreat and just taking the notes that Marissa took and putting them in the right, I put them in the right format and kind of wordsmith them. So um, added the, them as to action items, the timeline and the success indicators. Um, and as I said, apologize for not having them done. I honestly totally forgot that I hadn't had that done. So, <laughs> so, so here they are. Well, if you have any initial questions you wanted to, but what I would ask that you do is, so they'll, they'll be shared as a Google Doc, you know, please um, between now and um, that Wednesday before our, uh, our board meeting, um, which will be on the 28th, uh, so that would be the um, 25th. Uh, if, if you want to make any comments or anything, add or, or, or please use the Google Doc comments. Okay? Yeah. Should we, um, I don't see it on the agenda. Do we need to decide whether we're going to do this uh, conference? Yeah, I brought that up as well. Actually, we also needed to talk about facilities because Anne has brought up that she is not able to make those facility meetings. And we said we were going to mention it last time and we got busy. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Changing the dates of the meetings to accommodate more. All right, as everything should accommodate you. <laughs> All right, okay, that's problem solved. Check. Um, and then also, um, we wanted to talk about uh, the school boards convention, which is virtual. Um, just how we want that to look. Did everyone have a chance to look at it at all online as to what they've put out? Um, basically, they're going to run all the educational sessions that we would always go to, um, but it will be, you know, basically, you know, kind of. Eh, eh, as in our leisure, a little bit more. Pardon? Are they synchronous or asynchronous? That's a good. I think I, I thought they were asynchronous, but I'm not sure if all of them are. So, but the idea is, do we, um, you know, do we want to? So there's still interest in doing that and kind of taking that as like a professional development. Um, a lot of the top, you know, if you had a chance to look at the topics and. Um, if we if we do get our registration in, I think did you say there's like a bag or something? <laughs> I think that um, 
if we're gonna spend the money and do it, I think that it'd be really easy for us to not really take a really good advantage of it unless we maybe had a, a separate meeting, maybe an extra work session that we actually yeah to did report it, out did some of it, or at least just that was gonna be one of my like circled what we're gonna do and spread it out. So before I mean registration, how long is registration going? For early bird, it's pretty soon. I think early birds like the 20th or something. Like that. Then let's take a look at the the content um, of the sessions, the availability of looking at them, you know, who who will be available to do them and to report out. And it, you know, it might be where in years past we would, you know, a majority of us would go, maybe just a couple of us can take her, you know, on the sessions and bring that information back. So before um, the next meeting or the, the deadline, let's take a look at how we want to approach it. And then what do we want to do with that information? Like, do we want to report out at the next work session? Like, what will what will be the value in, in those sessions? And I know they, they significantly reduced the cost of just even the registration, so from years past. Are we allowed to have a Zoom, a separate Zoom meeting just to discuss convention? It wouldn't be considered a public meeting. We could have another work session and do it through Zoom, but it would have to be uh, what do you make public just, because yeah, I just wonder if we all went it. back and looked at the offerings and then we all just got together on a Zoom real quick and kind of discussed it. Okay. Or I mean we could just I'm sure because if we wait for offers for our next meeting, it's gonna be past the deadline for early bird registration. It's a significant discount. Yeah, what was the deadline? I think that we passed the deadline because it, it says the 13th, but I could call them and say, hey, could you give us an extra day? Okay. Because um, I thought that I. Yeah, started, I it was after. All right, I did too. All right, well, let's, um, let's go back and take a look at that. And by, how about by the end of the week, um, you know, send, even if everybody just emails your thoughts on how to approach it, we can get it together and see how many to register and how we want to go forward with it. Do you have anything to add to the convention? I don't. Uh, you know, if if the board decides that you want to involve with it and uh, the, if the sessions look good, um, I'm glad to, uh, glad to be a part of it with you. Okay. It's just, you know, there's a, there's a lot. Of there's a lot. I know. That's just part of it. Even going through the... But I, 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 want, I want the board to look at it and... and Let's take a look at the courses and there's a lot of breakouts and see what's even like the communication one. I know they're really focusing on reopening and on the pandemic. The long one sounded good this year too. And I mean very focused on what we're all dealing with right now. So But I like Betty's idea that we would commit to a session to do it so that we're not you know, maybe two people watch them together and I, it's always interesting to do it that way, you know. Yeah. All right. If we did it together, we only have to register for one. Correct? I know that's what I'm, I don't know. I'm not sure. Like, why couldn't we do it? Like, if there was three people interested in one particular strand, why couldn't we do it here and project it on the screen? I don't know. Right? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't see why you couldn't have two rooms going. You could have right. here in the alumni room yeah. and. Or you could have closed one of these off and, and we could do I imagine when you register, they're probably going to give you a login and password. And if we just bought a couple of them, we could probably just share them and like and do whatever. Right. Like, but, yeah. I don't see how, how they, they, they really kind of need to be supported. Hand. I don't think you could use the login twice. Do you know what I mean? That no, but if you had, if you, together, if you were projecting, right. I don't know how they would know you were projecting. Right, you couldn't. But if I think individually doing it at home, you could probably use the same yeah. password at the same time. But I think that they also reduce the price because it's virtual and the organization needs, that's their major fundraiser for the year and we should support that. And I don't think we should. Right, I think it's a reduced price, yeah. Why don't we and just, why don't you talk, why don't we buy three? Just do three? Why don't we buy three? Okay. And then we could break down, and, or do you think we should, are you saying that you, you think we should support them more? I mean, they're so not spending money on hotels and travel, and I think the, the at least the board members. I don't think necessarily you need to 
Yeah. No, I can, we can, Patty and I and, and, and Heather, if we want to catch a session, we could sit in with any of you guys who are taking it. I think the other thing is don't you get credit for attending? You do get credit towards your your achievement. And we have to ask if everybody's interested in doing that. Like Right. Commitment and stuff, and then you can do whatever you want. Well, okay. why don't you see what's yeah, the cost of seven passwords? You know, especially for the new board members, it's just a lot of really good stuff. But we could help steer you towards the really good stuff too. If we had a little time to talk oh, about it. <laughs> well, that's why if we did it, at least we don't know. How it, to do you it. might have a window to either. you might have a window to view the stuff, but we could at least do one night together. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking, and. And also, I mean, this is money that we had budgeted, and obviously, will there'll be a great savings to, from what we budgeted to what we can That's do. That's correct. Yeah, but if we, you're right. If we can agree on a few that we all want to see, maybe we can get a couple together in this room, a couple together in that room, one evening, yeah. and do them together. Yeah. It's 285 a member. So. Yeah, the early birds ended was, yesterday. Yeah, maybe it's 260. But I could, you know, if I call them tomorrow and say, hey, we missed out, what do you think? I, I don't know that a lot of districts are doing it. They'll be glad to get them. Yeah, sometimes. All right. Well, $1,500 or $1,600 was certainly a lot cheaper than, you know, even three month, three or four people going to New York City, you know, so. Right. For sure. And we don't have cake anymore, so. <laughs> no. Yeah, what about that? <laughs> Is <it> cupcakes? <laughs> Uh, it's 24 nights that I won't be having dinner. <laughs> Some of it's synchronous. Yeah, we got to dig into oh, it. A schedule. Yeah, so it's still going to be like we're going to have to dedicate that time. I was just going to say that in years past, I mean, there were only certain there were only a certain amount of sessions that you could get into, and sometimes you couldn't even get into. I mean, look at the there's been years that we got locked out as you're like running to get into the room, but you could always get into the other and get all of the documents and, get the PDFs and stuff. yeah and all of that information from them so i'm sure that that's all still well, i'm pretty sure that's all going to still be available so but well maybe while they're doing the, the synchronous they'll also take it much later yeah perhaps and by sync by synchronous i'm guessing that they're going to be recorded so yeah unless they're just people zooming in but i, I don't know We'll get that information and get it out to everybody and make that yeah, decision. Okay. All right. Um, was there anything more on the, the goals or any of those topics? All right. Then let's go ahead. I'd like to move to approve NA1, approval of the corrective action plan for the internal audit report, if I may have a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? So carried. I'd like to move to approve NA2, approval of the acceptance of the internal audit report, if I may have a second. 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 All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? So carried. I'd like to move to approve NA3, approval of the YMCA Buffalo Niagara pre-K and after school contract, if I may have a second. Second. Um, quick discussion. Um, Charlotte did catch that there was a typo for the year and you were going to strike that and correct it before we approved it yeah it just it had the, the she had 2019 instead of 2020 it was within the body of the contract under the terms three yeah. Yep. So is that something you already amended, Patty, or you need to do that now? Okay. All right. Okay. Very good. All in favor? Yeah. Yes. yes. Any opposed? So carried. And I would like to move to approve the consent agenda for personnel, if I may have a second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? So carried.
right, and I think that was it. Very good. I would like to move to adjourn. If I may have a second. All in favor? Yes. Yes. Adjourned.